Hello, welcome to today's Berkeley Book Chat. I'm Stephen Best, the director of Berkeley's Townsend Center for the Humanities. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, the Townsend Center will be hosting its events virtually for the remainder of the month. Um, please check the Townsend Center's website for the most up-to-date information on our events, as we hope to be back in person in March. Um, we're pleased to welcome Nicholas Matthew to discuss his most recent book, The Haydn Economy, Music, Aesthetics, and Commerce in the Late 18th Century. Nick is a professor of music and the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Professor in the Humanities. He's the author of Political Beethoven and the current co-editor of the journal Representations. Nick is joined by Emily Dolan, a professor in the Brown University Department of Music and herself a scholar of Haydn in 18th and 19th century European music. Before I turn things over to Nick and Emily, I'd like to draw your attention to a few upcoming, upcoming towns and events. On February 23rd, the Townsend Center, the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs and the Center for African Studies will co-sponsor a visit by the Senegalese philosopher, composer, and musician, Felwyn Saar. The author of Afrotopia and the recent African Meditations, Saar is known for conversing and theorizing through music. He will perform and hold a conversation with Natalia Brizuela of the Spanish and Portuguese department. The SAR event will take place at BAM PFA and entry is free, but reservations are required. So um, please go to the BAM PFA website um, to secure your tickets. Our next book chat will take place next Wednesday on February 15th. Andrew Schenken, a professor in the Department of Architecture and the Program in American Studies will discuss his recent book, The Everyday Life of Memorials, Andrew's interlocutor will be David Henkin, a professor in Berkeley's Department of History. That's it for now, now in terms of updates. We're looking forward to your conversation, Nick and Emily. Hello, everyone. Hi, Nick. It's lovely to be here, and I'm just looking forward to this. Um, I'll just say a couple more uh, words to get us get us going here. Um, so Stephen mentioned that Nick is the author of Political Beethoven, which came out in 2013. He's also the co-editor of The Invention of Beethoven and Rossini, along with gobs of articles, including a recent, really wonderful recent essay on, on mediation and listening and representations and an article on Gould and Liberace in the Journal of Musicological Research. Um, Nick is also a dear friend with whom I've had countless conversations about music, the enlightenment and life in general. So I'm just especially delighted uh, to be here chatting about Nick's most recent and brilliant book, The Haydn Economy, published just last year. Um, with the University of Chicago Press. Uh, this is a book about Haydn, and the easy description would be to say that it's a material history of the late 18th century. It delves into the ways in which Haydn's music and career were inextricably bound up with the changing Enlightenment media landscapes. Maybe you could say it's a really powerful demonstration of that memorable pronouncement of Siskin and Warner that the Enlightenment was an event in the history of mediation. But Media and mediation are really central to the story that Nick is telling here, but this is not merely a material uh, history. And he says, you know, the introduction music was not uh, just the byproduct of certain media ecologies. Music also helps shape these ecologies. And so I read this book much more as a history of the forces, the human, the creative, the economic forces that animated various media forms. It's a story about circulation, whether we're talking about the use and reuse of stock musical ideas, to the movement of Haydn's music, um, to the way in which music more generally could move and animate. And maybe the most gripping part of this book is the way in which it attunes us to changing values and emerging distinctions be between artwork and commodity, aesthetics and economics, the role of labor and how these distinctions are drawn. And so I thought maybe we could jump in um, and Nick, I would love to hear you say a little bit more about the origin of this project. You had a big book on Beethoven, you've moved to Haydn, what motivated sort of the relationship between these projects and how you and how you got here. Uh, thanks, Emily. Um, so uh, it, it's a, a sort of a crude uh, taxonomy, I think, for, but, but one that might be useful for people who certain, certainly aren't in sort of music history. 
that um, within sort of single composer discourses, uh, particularly for those who do Beethoven, there is, uh, I would say, a bit of a split. Um, and, you know, you know, why study such a overweeningly, sort of overbearingly powerful figure, someone who um, can be, you know, regarded as in some sense the heart, sort of the heart of darkness of our discipline in the sense that so much of what is bad and oppressive and authoritarian about musical culture as well as exclusive and eventually, you know, white supremacists and everything can be pinned on Beethoven or at least found in very close proximity to him. Um, but on the other hand, of course, as with any uh, overweening cultural figure, it, his status, his the meanings to which his music has been put have to be accounted for, as well as, of course, all the affective attachments, the forms of politics, both radical and regressive and illiberal and, you know, progressive that his uh, music has been marshaled in the service of. And for me, the doing the Beethoven book, it was always about um re-socializing a practice that perhaps had come to be seen in a lot of domains as not terribly socialized right just simply throwing this often quite distant untouchable music back into um the material relationships the political sort of contestations the messy and complex events um uh the often quite inscrutable political purposes that actually witnessed its its birth you know that actually that, that these were the contexts in which it was born and in all sorts of repressed ways you know that we're still responding to those environments even when we're not aware of them or don't know anything about them that actually that that's a past you know a la Faulkner or James Baldwin you know that, that, that isn't dead that's that still lives in the music and actually coming to understand where this music came from actually is another way of understanding what it might still be or what the effects it might still have. Now, within Beethoven, I think there are people who want to do that, or perhaps not so many, but I'm one of them. And there are people who, you know, really do want to be in the business of, of still protecting this kind of romantic modernist tradition. And those who are interested in re-socialising this music often have... Uh, been disproportionately interested in Haydn, Beethoven's teacher. And there's a reason for that, which is that, you know, Haydn, although a well-known composer and you can still go and hear his music performed in concert halls and particularly by string quartets or whatever around the world or indeed in Berkeley every single year, isn't known as well perhaps as other figures with the same status. And there are a number of reasons for that having to do with, you know, the the contingencies of 19th century reception but one of the reasons for that is that you know Haydn has been very hard to separate from these densely material you know profoundly commercial worlds that that produced Haydn as a phenomenon and in that way Beethoven's very different you know, Beethoven was you know uh, uh, of the same generation as Wordsworth and you know came to share the rhetoric of a kind of resistance to a particular sort of worldliness and certainly to market forces as however he was beginning to experience those at the start of the 19th century whereas Haydn's career extends right you know from the 1740s actually I mean certainly 1750s through until the early 19th century and he participated in and shaped and witnessed as a celebrity but also as a you know fairly humble vice capellmeister as a jobbing teacher um as a entrepreneur um and latterly even as a sort of you know vaunted romantic genius he participated in the production of a lot of uh, modern musical culture that we still have so that was the appeal to me always, is that there's something intensely worldly, actually kind of almost a bit techy. You know, people who love playing music often love playing Haydn's music because there's something about this music that allows you to get under the hood, really sort of see how it's made. There's not there's not a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's not a lot of romantic de demystification going on. It's... Uh, it's very direct music, quite practical music, quite clever music. You know, it's music that uh, lets you know what it's up to. And this is a, a part of a reflection of um, the circumstances with, that it was always in dialogue with. Um, so that's definitely what appealed to me about Haydn as a topic. Thanks. Uh, 
and you know, hopefully that's we keep coming back to. I we've all probably all of that experience teaching Haydn in in the classroom where if you're teaching Mozart and Haydn say that students come in knowing a lot about Mozart and they but then they learn about Haydn like I never knew this is amazing <laughs> and that, that's just that's just a wonderful a wonderful thing. Um, I wanted to chat about the sort of remarkable timeliness of of this book. Um, you touch on so many themes in this book, attention, objecthood, agency, voice, racialized listening, soundscapes, resonance, new media, new materialism, that most folks would associate with 20th century, 21st century uh, music, and probably not with the late um, 18th century. I was even reflecting as I was rereading everything that even though you're not um, explicitly delving into something like artificial intelligence and creativity, which are things that are sort of sparking people's um, interest right now, that the way in which that you're diving into stock music and its changing values could even be seen as a kind of um, prehistory to thinking about uh, that, that kind of um, mode of creativity. And I just thought it'd be interesting to chat a little bit more about the way in which the book kind of straddles the late enlightenment and, and the present and sort of how it took that shape. Yeah, so um, uh, it's it's funny. I mean, I suppose, d despite a modest resurgence of books on single figures, um, uh, there is, I think, probably s something a little old-fashioned about the fact that I take one figure. But it's quite convenient that I focus on one figure in part because you know he was involved in everything, and it's not it's not really my uh, it's it's not my objective in the book to to make a big deal out of what an exception Haydn was. Although in some ways he was, you know, he was certainly more abundantly mediated as a as a musical figure than probably anyone, certainly up until Rossini. Um, and uh, but more important to me is actually his sort of uh, ordinariness and actually this this ordinary engagement with the very stuff of everyday late eighteenth century life is uh, the um, is so copiously accounted for there's so much data about it there's so much information about it so much written about it he kept notebooks he was abundantly written about such that it just it became obviously an incredibly rich area of study to explore the kind of themes that I'm very interested in now as far as kind of resonances or or connections with our own time of concern I mean I think that this is something that's familiar across the humanities. People who study the 18th century are often in the business of saying, look, it's it's modernity, you know, but not as you know it, right? But that, um, both strategically and because there's, uh, I think, good evidence for it. People in the 18th century frequently want to say, we're describing moments, whether in Europe or its colonies, that ideas that the sort of central ideologies and political structures um, and economic institutions of a fully more fully fledged 19th century modernity are being born that we can see in almost an archaeology of those structures and because we can see an archaeology of them something about the things that makes them possible but is more visible in the 18th century than it would be when we often enter the quite burnished and taxonomic uh, spaces of 19th century sort of disciplinarity or you know, museum culture or concert culture or whatever it might be. And that I think is certainly true in this period that you know what's what's interesting about Haydn is that he really genuinely does begin his career in a world that is very like uh, a world of feudal patronage uh, for the production of music that has been around, certainly in his small corner of Hungary for, I would say, hundreds of years. And he ends his career as something much more like mm, a modern art hero come musical entrepreneur. And he has to adapt his self-image um, and he has to adapt his perception of what it is, what kind of work it is to be a musician. He has to adapt his sense of what his music is going to do when he composes it and it disappears into this you know, newly teeming, newly mobile world around him. And 
in a way his music is a you know bears the traces of this adaptation but also he himself thinks about or responds to this process of adaptation um and you know so it's it's in that that one can see i think as well the sort of quite intimate musical archaeology of a kind of modern modern culture a kind of modern, modern capitalist culture now as far as the analogies with our own time are concerned right i think that they're legion and i try not to push them home too hard lest it be seen as a little glib or you know reductive but i hope that it emerges in the book that really this is a book about the present too um, it's a book about the point at which mobility and relationality and material uh, ways of conceiving of the world become not just facts but values, right? I mean, these you know that these are ways that we want to think about the world, and that um, the reason perhaps that many people want to think about the world that way is in part because they're vaunted within particular liberal capitalist or indeed neoliberal capitalist ways of conceiving of the social world and our economic relations. Um, but another very simple fact about the period, as you um, mentioned before, when you cited Siskin and Warner, is that you know, Haydn's period was a period of radical media disruption and proliferation, and he was an enormous beneficiary of these new media regimes. And in a way, he was living through the inverse of, I think, what we've lived through in our lifetimes, which is he saw the congealment of a sort of print dominated uh, uh, regime of capitalist musical reproduction that would be relatively stable for a century and a half at least. Um, and we are living through its its comparative dissolution through the rupture of another media regime. All kinds of things that he saw the beginnings of, musical copyright, for example, uh, coming under enormous pressure now because of uh, the inability of, let's say, our current legal regimes, which date back to the 18th century, to keep a pace with the ways that we now have of reconfiguring and sharing music. Um, he was attuned to uh, not just music's new circulability or commutability, but to the fact that music was perhaps newly available to be uh, broken up, to be circulated in pieces and reconfigured. Um, a new form of digital interface that was everywhere called the piano keyboard, these are your digits, um, and uh, was was available in everyone's parlor and a semi-digital form of information sharing called you know printed European staff notation was compressing um the data of giant events and operatic performances down to a scale that could be reproduced in people's houses um uh, over and over again for people perhaps who would never have the opportunity to see music on such a scale and again, we're living through a period in which the stability of that media regime is being eroded and abraded by new accelerated forms of mobility, new kinds of circulability, new forms of musical commutation. Um, uh, whether the work that everybody does nowadays as, uh, you know, bedroom composers, I think of Billie Eilish there, you know, sort of, winning Grammys from her and her brother's bedroom, whether this work is even conceivable any longer as work, certainly as wage labor or as a form of perhaps web-based patronage is something that people wonder about these days as the music industry is gradually kind of um, uh, dissolved by uh, the various pressures of uh, new digital media. And likewise, Haydn in his own period saw um, you know, had to reconsider whether he was a whether he was a, a subject of patronage anymore. Had to understand himself afresh as a wage labourer, something that had never happened to him until he arrived in London until the 1790s, and realised that his compositions could be more or less paid for by the yard. You know that his, suddenly his time was money, uh, and suffered the psychic consequences, as I think we're seeing these days. That you know that there are psychological consequences from of the erosion between what counts as creativity, what counts as play, what counts as work, what counts as self-presentation, what counts as 
self-curation. Haydn experienced that, you know, when in going from a world where his prestige was absolutely guaranteed by extremely um, immovable feudal structures of authority in which his proximity to a prince and the prince's imprimatur gave him an enormous amount of influence and power both within his court and beyond. And he entered a sphere in which he was being tested by how many tickets he could sell or by how many uh, copies of a new set of string quartets that would be purchased by people in booksellers. And that led him to experience, you know, I would suggest, you know, for the first time, he's the, the first composer who experiences things like stress, right? I mean, he really does write about, you know, it's not the first time he's been busy, but it's the first time he's experienced that busyness as a kind of psychic pressure, as a, taking on too much, as un, being, un, being unsure about whether all of these energies that he's um, that he's putting into this endeavour, um, what kind of value they have, whether it's an economic value or a different kind, and he's really, I mean, yeah, a, a sort of a gauge then of this uh, of this new. Um, media regime and uh, sort of his place within a, a, an, an emerging recipient kind of capitalist economic arrangement. So this gets at a bunch of a bunch of stuff, and I'm trying to figure out which direction to go here. One is, you know, to sort of stay with Haydn's worldliness and ordinariness, as as you've just described it. Um, you have this nice line in the introduction about how ultimately Haydn is you know, the subject of the most historically nuanced and theoretically creative corners in, in, the, in the 18th century. And, and this is something we, we've talked about in other contexts, is this sense in which Haydn does whatever work we want him uh, to do when we go to the 18th century. If I want to talk about the history of orchestration, I can go to Haydn and, and he does that. If you want to talk about changing media forms, you can go to Haydn for that. And so I think that that itself is interesting that the the ways in which we can constantly reinvent Haydn precisely because he wasn't his image wasn't codified in the 19th century the way that both Beethoven and, and Mozart were. Um, but it also gets at something about the 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 distance of Haydn's inner life from the discussions that we're having here, except that you're actually starting to talk about that and thinking about stress and sort of the the different things that he had to sort of encounter and ne negotiate, which you you tease out the, throughout the book. And I, I don't know, do you feel closer to Haydn the man? Through the... <laughs> it's not really the question I want to ask, but it's sort of it's, it lurks there in Haydn's studies about how close we are to like how much of this has anything to do with any kind of inner inner life. Well, I, I mean, I would I'd put it this way. I mean, Haydn was there when inner life was being born. <laughs> you know, he's the subject of some of the earliest inner life type biographies that were written of composers based on interviews with him. You know, the, the earliest biographies by Diesen Griesinger. I mean, Griesinger had been his friend for a long time. Dies was a kind of amateur artist who just kept showing up, basically, when he was an old dude and kept asking him about what he remembered at a time when his memory was, was really failing him. Um, and it's in those biographies from the first decade of the 19th century that you start to see, you know, certain romantic tropes appearing about Haydn's own sort of development as a, you know, exceptional human subject. And uh, the, a lot of the sort of narrative forms that would come to shape, you know, Beethoven biography uh, uh, established there too. His humble beginnings, for example, which is you know, not a fabrication, just not something that necessarily anyone would be that interested in in the 18th century, given that to be a musician was generally to be of humble origins. And it's a fairly humble occupation, particularly if you were working effectively as a servant, servant at court. But of course, by the time he was a celebrity, the humbleness of his uh, origins became uh, an interesting uh, feature of his biography and Beethoven even had a picture of the house he grew up in in Rohau next to his bed um, uh, as he was dying and apparently pointed at it and said, ah, oh, what a humble dwelling for such a great man to be born in. Um, he was the son of a wheelwright, you know, and was like a lot of uh, kids given that opportunity when it turned out he could sing, was sent away to Vienna to 
study in the uh, chorus at the Stephansdom, and as soon as his voice broke, was basically on his own and had to more or less, you know, job it around Vienna, working with whichever musicians he could find in order to make ends meet. And was extremely fortunate in the end to get a couple of Kapellmeister positions um, that uh, allowed him to pursue the kind of career that musicians had been pursuing for you know, generations and generations before him. And it's important that because, you know, if you look at his first contract, and it's something I'm really interested in in the book, um, what it expects of Haydn, what is demanded of him is just so alien <laughs> to um, the way in which people came to think about his work, even, you know, just within his own lifetime, toward, to, toward the end of his life. Um, and, you know, he's he, for one, I mean, he's paid in things like firewood, um, and even, you know, when he's on the verge of leaving to go and make some cash in London for the first time, one of the biggest inducements to keep Haydn in Vienna, as far as I can work out, is that he's given an extra pig, right? So this is, he's still working with an essentially a barter economy, and he's still required to do things that a servant of the court would do. So, you know, high up on the list of things he's supposed to do is to ensure that the orchestra is powdering their wigs and dressed in the right clothes, that he shows up on time, that he shows himself in the antechamber of his prince every day and asks if he needs any music. Um, he certainly doesn't own any of the music that he does. And the idea that he has any claim of intellectual property is just so alien to that way of looking at the world. All of it is the property of his prince, but it's not even that it's the property of, its, of, its, of his prince. The entire milieu of the Esterhazy court in Bonden Bay, Hungary, where he was an extremely prestigious Kapellmeister, didn't even treat music as if it was something that could be possessed quite properly, because, you know, the material forms that this music took wasn't amenable to the kinds of economic extraction that later would be, um, you know, enacted on Haydn's music to, to a massive scale. You know, things were circulating in manuscript, things were performed on the day. There were a lot of symphonies and things, but most of them were being performed for theatrical performances in between acts of Shakespeare plays, things like that. Most of the Haydn that got out before about 1780 or so of the milieu of the Esterhazy court just sort of leaks out, more or less. You know, either clandestine copies made by unscrupulous copyists who know people who can who can indeed extract value from a new string quartet in Amsterdam or in Paris, you know, where the piracy is an enormous part of early musical circulation. Haydn knows barely anything of this. I mean, he's, he's aware that his uh, Stabat Mater, you know, is, it gets gets out and ends up at the Paris uh, Concert Spirituel, partly because Pergolesi's version is even more famous and it's a sort of an almost an emulation of it. Um, he doesn't make money from it. He's just sort of the prestige of it being elsewhere. And actually, but when he in sort of emerges with a new contract in the 1780s, probably one of several new contracts that are trying to take account of kind of new economic conditions that his uh, have been brought about by sort of, you know, a couple of local printers of maps basically diversifying into doing music. Um, so there's now sort of Viennese-based uh, music publishers uh, and also the fact that his prince has died and the new one is less interested in him doing musical stuff uh, in Esterhazy. So he has a new contract. Now, this new contract allows him for the first time in the 1780s to actually sort of keep money from the proceeds of his music. And when he sort of, as it were, emerges into this newly connected Viennese world, although it's going to be not nearly as exciting or as competitive or as, um, I suppose, you know, incipiently bourgeois as the scenes are in London that he will eventually visit in the 1790s. Still, he's shocked by the extent to which he's known by people. You know, he's sort of, all this time, he has been working, and as I try and show in the book, as it were, this feudal system kind of, really gave him the tools where by the time he encountered the incipient versions of capitalism, he was he was ready to dominate. You know, he could turn these skills 
to this new account, to the new account of extracting surplus value from from all this music and all these techniques that he built up. I mean, he was absolutely going to clean up. He was probably better placed to clean up than anybody. But he was shocked to see that he was a celebrity, you know, and it's, it's remarkable, you know, because he suddenly realizes music is being performed not just all over Europe, but you know, in Philadelphia and in Calcutta and eventually in, you know, in Rio de Janeiro. And and um, he's encountering this knowledge as part of a new encounter with what Pocock, you know, famously called the, the world of moving objects. So, you know, and it's you know, profoundly colonial. It's this colonial fantasy of a kind of connected world. And he comes back from, you know, a Christmas trip to Vienna at the end of the 1780s. And he, he says, oh, I'm so miserable here to his friend Mariana von Gensing. He's like, I have to, I have to come back to this castle and eat in the mess with all the officers and have their horrible little sausages and and uh, and um you know eat all the food they eat and do what my prince tells me and i don't know as he said whether i'm a capellmeister or a capel servant you know that when i was in vienna he said they were offering me pineapple ice cream and chocolate and coffee you know all these things that come from colonies you know and they say oh my dear Haydn, would you like some of this would you like some cream and so on and so on you know, he is um, emerging as a new celebrity, and the condition for that is this new interconnectedness. Um, so in a way, the story of, you know, do I know Haydn as a man, is actually the story of Haydn's coming to know himself very differently via these worlds. That, you know, the very notion of an inner life, you know, even Forkel's early Bach biographies of the, you know, early, of the, like, around 1800, J.S. Bach, no one cares about his inner life, whatever. He just sort of hung around the Thomas Kirch in Leipzig and had tons of babies, you know. <laughs> the idea that there was an inner life worth knowing um, was, in a sense, uh, anathema to the entire tradition that Bach composed within. Not so, of course, his more, much more modern, much more mediated children. I mean, you know, like uh, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, his second eldest son, who was, you know, widely recognized as the greatest keyboardist of his age and of whom Haydn was an enormous fan within the much more sort of, within the kind of modern Anglo sphere of sort of Hanseatic Germany was, doing nothing but inner life and celebrity you know I mean, there's a famous fantasy of his that circulated in manuscript initially in the 18th century called cp bach's empfindung and cp bach's feelings you know there was none of that for haydn until much later um but of course by the time he's in london all anyone cares about is his feelings, you know, and of course, feelings are all the rage, you know, inner life is all the rage, you know, sensibility, this new culture of sentiment, these emotions in motion, this music of his that could stimulate the thousand, you know, romantic thoughts of young ladies in solitude at their square pianos, his English cantonettas, his chamber music, his piano sonatas, you know, and then ultimately, you know, when he comes back to Vienna, this these depictions of the exalted in a life of of the godlike, you know, Promethean artists, like at the start of the creation, where he, you know, creates light for a second time ex nihilo with a blast of trumpets and drums. You know, you know, by that time, inner life has, as it were, you know, travelled, you know, the full journey from a matter of no interest accompanying the working life of a Kapellmeister to a matter of considerable interest in the culture of sort of commercial sensibility in London to the only thing that matters amongst a generation of, you know, romantic, romantic geniuses. Just a reminder to everyone that you can drop questions in the chat on YouTube that will be funneled to me to ask uh, Nick. Um, sort of staying with this idea of, of sympathy uh, that, that you touched on, maybe the most unexpected chapter for me in the book is your third chapter, Objects, which opens with the keepsakes I received in like, like stick pins, boxes, stockings, and it turns to the more sort of the general animation of small objects and then and into song and leading us to abolitionist songs that were published and consumed by women um, in domestic settings and you you talk about the the work of the cultivation of sympathy that these songs can and cannot uh do and i think that, you know this chapter is just fascinating just for the range of places that you go um in it 
Um, but I'm also wondering if you want to say more um, about this chapter, um, about what you're doing here in terms of historicizing ideas of agency. I'm thinking of all of the our sort of uh, Latorian enthusiasms around mm-hmm. giving objects agency right now, and that, that's still sort of uh, lingering right now. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, you, you know, the I, I, you know, it was very important to me while I was writing this book to make it quite uh, uh, dense uh, with stuff. And, um, you know, this is this is more of a book writing workshop kind of observation. But, you know, I, I, I partly because of the subjects that I've written about and, have, uh, and the ways I wanted to write about them, I've often found myself sort of accidentally being a bit of a polemicist or at least having to argue things strongly and I really wanted in this book to be able to be descriptive and poetic and expository um but the some of the few times in the book where I let my hair down or you know maybe where the hair bursts over my shirt and I allow myself a finger wag is is in relation to I think modern a uh, present day rather um methodologies derived from things like Victorian sociology um and the tremendous amount of faith that seems to me that is placed on the political efficacy of animating non-human things or um particularly on the sort of confer voice conferral uh, onto objects and you know uh, the 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 place this has had in discourses about race and gender in particular um and uh i th- here's where i think knowing about music and knowing about the 18th century really help right i felt like if latour had known very much about either um although he was known nincompoop about the 18th century but uh if he'd known more about either i think maybe some of the some of the latourian uh assumptions would have been called into question earlier um and it's not just latour of course we're talking about an entire um uh, family of related methods that emphasize material mediation and uh, the anim- the animation of non-human things and the reason is of course that people in the 18th century have spoken about the conferral of voices on things for years you know i mean it goes back to the earliest work on it narratives the novels of circulation in literary studies um in which the conferral of voices on things you know as things that tell their own stories like handkerchiefs and co- you know, coins and banknotes in particular pens and so on in other words small commutable objects uh, in which that has often been understood to be as it were registering imaginatively the new mobility of stuff in a period in which stuff is you know on the move is 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 being exchanged much more readily and in which people are living in worlds in which the small things that surround them are much more likely than ever before to be from somewhere else um in other words you know in that reading we're dealing with a prehistory of the 19th century commodity form right the idea that you may, may be alienated to some degree from how it was made it may be mechanically reproducible but in a way the compensation is an aesthetic one right that you know they're sort of in the classic marxian mode that the commodity speaks right it it, it it's it uh, he actually has it speak of course the paradox in marx is it, it says i am you know <laughs> i have no int- intrinsic value uh which is this uh, sort of hilarious point of performative contradiction in marx where in saying it has no value it still it retains this promise this attractive voice this appealing connection with us um and indeed you know but there's been a lot lots written about that bit at the beginning of capital where commodities speak and a lot has been written about the prehistory and speaking commodities not much has really been written about commodities that sing and uh that's a shame because actually commodities did that much more right um because the ultimate commodities in the 18th century and actually i would argue and indeed today the ultimate commodity remains the pop song and really we're, we're living through the era um uh in the 18, late 18th century in which the the economic aesthetic and media framework of what would be the pop song were more or less being produced um uh, in other words, a widely distributable and mechanically reproducible form of singable culture, right, that that was in dialogue with methods of mechanical reproduction like the domestic piano and that had 
a particular formal structure based around repetition and hooks, right? And Haydn produced quite a few of them himself, not least in his sets of English canzonettas that he um, collaborated on the great uh, English uh, blue stocking Anne Hunter, who's the wife of the obviously famous surgeon John Hunter. Uh, he collaborated with her on most of them. Um, it's a largely female musical culture, um, and uh, by which I mean it's about domestic settings, but it's also consumed by women keyboardists by and large uh, who are using pop music in domestic rituals of display and solitude and sentiment and the marriage market and all of the things that young ladies use song and play the piano for in Jane Austen novels and you know Francis Burney novels um, and indeed Haydn sits with many of these young women you know Cecilia Barthélemont the daughter of uh, the French violinist is very close to him. He ins inscribes, he gives her copies of the Canzonettas. His lover, when he's in London, the widow Rebecca Schroeter is another example, but there are many more. And he's in these milieu a lot. Um, my point is this, I suppose, about the uh, sort of new circulability and power of these small musical singing commodities. Uh, in the 18th century. One is that they tend to, uh, in giving an archaeology of our current concern with the agency and vocality of things, they kind of belie the assumption that having a voice axiomatically gives you power, um, that actually voices were one of the most common things that objects had in this period. In fact, it's one of the things that marked these new species of objects out from people was their incessant vocality. And um, of course, you know, over the years, through different waves of different kinds of scholarship, um, we've often found, you know, Matthew Head's work does this very beautifully, I think, even now, we've found ways to go to the keyboard to go to these uh female musicians like Cecilia Bartelamont and find ways of recovering agency in these highly managed spaces of feeling and self-presentation um through music often through voice you know this is a common place within voice studies that sopranos you know while I don't know uh, uh, oppressed and exploited of course but not just by the systems of labor within which they work, but you know, there's where the narrative systems within which they work within opera and so on that always culminate in their glorious demise. Um, nonetheless, the voice in some sense overwhelms those logics. Uh, it represents some residue of agency that we can recover theoretically. So there are versions of that within uh, studies of much you know, smaller scale domestic music. And of course, it bears repeating that voice, you know, within music, while having a powerful material and disciplinary dimension, also uh, has another life, you know, simul simultaneous and in some some senses, you know, really significantly imbricated as a trope, as a political trope that to have voices, to have agency, to to have your voice listened to is to be representable within a liberal political polity. And indeed, the entire liberal metaphysic of governance and who gets to be represented is arguably predicated, some might argue, uh, say, on a um, on uh, assumptions about voice, who has it, who should have it, who's going to be given it, and uh, somewhat more invisibly, who gets to confer voices on people magnanimously uh, in the uh, show of uh, inclusion. And um, I see all of this at work, actually, in the aesthetics of music in the 18th century, that actually, you know, women are both made highly visible. This has been observed before, you know, by scholars like Emma Cleary in this period as consumers, but also as objects of consumption, as people whose mm, co new co-presence with men in public spaces is cited by people like David Hume as evidence of sort of growing civilization, but also who have the catastrophes of a new and emerging form of economic uh, uh, system 
sort of a place at their door, you know, that there's a, 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 a recurrent misogynistic discourse of women as thoughtless consumers, not least in relation, of course, to um, anti-slavery campaigning in which thoughtless women are often styled as consumers of, you know, blood-soaked pro uh, products like sugar um, or um, uh, colonially derived products like tea. Um, so, you know, we have this very interesting uh, um, dynamic when a woman sits at a keyboard to sing in which, on the one hand, she is being invoiced, right? She actually has some kind of power as a seductive um, object of aesthetic attention, but also, as is what my formulation just implied, also becomes one of those objects. And this is a sort of feature of... You might say, you know, the Burkean beautiful or the Hogarthian beautiful or some paradigmatic version of the late 18th century beautiful is that it makes objects out of people. You know, it turns people into um, uh, 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 things that are amenable to the gaze and consumption of consumers, male or female. And um, of course, that's profoundly gendered. And of course, and interestingly, music is very concretely complicit in this, not just in making voices sound, but in the very style of this music that emphasizes, that emphasizes a kind of sinuous surface that is so important in uh, the conceptualization of beautiful objects in this period that, you know, a song like a pastoral song from the first book of Canzonettas, which is cited by William Gardner as the, you know, the ultimate sort of Hogarthian line of beauty in music, actually produces in the performing woman a kind of sinuous sensuous sonic body available to be consumed and as it were contains it within this neatly commutable pop music container and it's not it's no wonder that you know this was commutable not just as a print object and as a keepsake that was inscribed but also ended up you know on a pair of socks <laughs> was sent to hide you know it was, a, it was part of this commodity culture that actually involved women and i suppose the last part of that is that this becomes especially fraught in in uh, the case of abolitionist song that was, you know, cheek by jowl with Haydn's music, both in the domestic setting and in public settings like the, you know, pleasure gardens in London, where a lot of abolitionist song was being sung by the same people uh, uh, who were performing in sort of incipient blackface kind of roles, the Eagle and the Yarrick, the Yarrico tradition, um, stuff by George Coleman, you know, that's on at the same time that these people are singing Haydn songs and they're singing abolitionist songs, but it's not clear the line between invoicing enslaved African people and playing, um, you know, roles that involve racial mimicry is extremely blurred. And it's most blurred when you look at, at song, right? It's, 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 it's because it's in song, in the sort of at literal invoicement and, and making available for aesthetic delectation other people's voices, right, or the sort of inhabiting of another body, that, it, that this line between racial mimicry and a kind of, I don't know, this, uh, you know, this has been written about extensively, this is sort of the, the desire to inculcate, you know, sympathy for uh, the for, for enslaved people amongst those who otherwise are too, you know, not too, not proximate enough to it or can't feel it. That line is extremely blurry. And actually, you know, it turns out that many of these songs trade in a lot of the surface emphasizing sinuous musical stylistic devices that encourage a kind of attention to a sort of as it were musical epidermis that actually that it's not that one takes song and racializes it to some sort of later stage but um in my view it's that the very aesthetic conditions of 18th century beauty are the same that eventually would be epidermalized as it were in 19th century traditions of scientific racism and that is not merely an analogy or some kind of sort of you know forced um attempt to find a link here Haydn is mixing in the circles with people who are fascinated by people's voices and by the surfaces of people's bodies not least the husband of Anne Hunter in whose house he visits in whose house he has goes to salons 
um, and where he actually himself performs his songs. So there's a sense in which, thereby, therefore, this uh, history of 18th century objecthood and voice conferral and this complex relationship between voice as both objectifying and conferring of agency, this complex relationship between um, uh, gender, race, and beautiful surface in the 18th century, and the way that they all come together in this kind of popular culture of the keepsake, the object, and the pop song, right? For me, function as a really powerful caution, I wouldn't say it's a thoroughgoing critique, but a really powerful caution to present day methodologies that would proceed too triumphantly with the idea that invoicing and granting agential power to quote unquote non-human things is uh, an axiomatic political good. Thanks. So questions are starting to come in on the, the chat here. So I'll read you the, the first one. Um, what was Haydn doing that caused him to be so perfectly enmeshed in this emerging culture of music, economics, and fame in contrast to other contemporaneous composers? Um, why doesn't the same thing happen to someone like, say, Kramer? Mm, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, in, in some ways, of course, uh, you know, Kramer or whatever is is perfectly enmeshed, right? Um, he's not. He doesn't have the social resources that um, Haydn has. So, I mean, he, you know, Haydn is starting at a considerable advantage. Remember, because not only has he built up this sort of arsenal of techniques and music that will allow him to dominate in this. Uh, emerging commercial sphere in London and elsewhere, but he also still has the support of a lucrative Esther Hussey position that really requires him to do very little at the end of his life. He's composing you know, a mass every year and, and uh, a little bit of ceremonial music. Um, so he's in a way taking advantage, and this is quite an important part of the story actually, that it's not this schematic thing in which one sort of obsolete social form like feudalism or something seeds to modern commercial society actually the two interpenetrate and will indeed for you know many many decades afterwards you know it's not as if Liszt isn't in Weimar or Wagner isn't taking money from mad King Ludwig right that um but th they really are closely enmeshed in this period so the fact that he has the support of the Prince of Wales and the English royal the British royal family in the 1790s is really important to his success in Hanover Square. The fact that he's got an Esther Hussey position to fall back on when he's selling music on the side to people like John Bland in London and so on. Um, the fact that he can be such a double crosser, you know, he can give every, he sort of at one point is giving about five different publishers exclusive copyright to his music. Um, and it doesn't really matter. He gets, that's he always to me, it's a sign that, mm -hmm. that he doesn't quite get how circulation works yet, that he does. That That's he does. true. And actually, you know, but again, these are protocols that are being produced in real time. Right. So he's figuring out what the limits of this are. He ends up in the court of chart of uh, is it the court of Exchequer, I think, when he's in London because he gets taken to court and it's actually potentially quite embarrassing. Like they find out that he's sold an entire string quartet that's actually by Playl as if it's his to William Forster. And he's like, meh. And actually no one really cares that much as long as they get their cash, it turns out. Um, so they're still trying to figure out what's important and what's not. And I think that's the, maybe the second part of the question is that he never was fully at home. That there are all sorts of points in this book where his out of stepness with his environment is clearly appreciable. You know, he becomes out of step with the Esterhazy milieu, I think, in the 1780s. Um, he, when he gets back from London, is so relieved to become just like a, the, you know, a subject of patronage again. But he's able to take advantage of what has become a sort of more lively commercial sphere in Vienna. But his music, those late oratorios, the creation and the seasons, actually ply between those worlds in ways that, I mean, I think pop accounts maybe for why they're not, I mean, they're canonical pieces, but they're not, you know, they're not, they didn't become the romantic masterworks that he thought he was producing with Van Sweeten when he composed them, you know, and certainly Van Sweeten thought they were going to be. Um, and you see that in their reception, particularly of the seasons, you know, one of the things I write about in relation to his changing perception of labour and the artist as labourer is this, huge chorus in the um, seasons 
in, in, in autumn, which is in praise of work. And actually, you know, in the poem, it's the sort of big Georgic, isn't it? The Thomson poem. It's just hundreds and hundreds of lines. It's sort of the typical Thomson thing about how all civilization is made from work. And it starts with just sort of the, you know, hewing wood, tilling the soil, and it all ends up with London and its mighty domes and all this, the Thames, you know, and everything. You now all culture appears from work. And it's very, very sort of British, right? It's very much of the period. These sort of Georgic justifications you get in other people like Knight and you've got Price and all these people of kind of the might of British commerce, and you derive it from this sort of Lockean moment of the sort of metabolic interaction of the body and nature in the form of labour. And that produces property, you know. And so Haydn with Van Sweden thinks, great, I'll have a massive course in, in, in honour of work. Oh, Fleiss, uh, uh, oh, edler Fleiss von dir kommt alles heil, oh, noble work. Everything great, you know, comes from you. And um, the list is really boring. Like the text is, everyone hated it because it doesn't have all the stuff that's in the Thompson Poem. So it's just, it goes, oh, you know, we wear clothes and there's some food and it's really great. Thanks, Fleiss, toil. And, but it gets this treatment like work. Wow, I love work. And C major, and it's got this huge fugue at the end. And actually the fugue is exactly the same as the fugue at the very end, which is like, that's the vision of the pearly gates opening. It's like Godhead is work you know it's, it's maybe perfect for our current sensibilities and um everyone at the even people who are big supporters were a bit like it's a bit weird why has he written a massive like handelian fugue in praise of working that's really daft um and you know that's that is a theme right the way through until his late biographies so yeah, that's just one example of the ways in which, although Haydn was enormously well placed, you know, with all the social resources to be able to exploit these emergent forms of economic organisation, actually, he often found himself quite interestingly for me, because, you know, I think that the ambiguity is much more important than the, the, the ways in which he seemed you know, perfectly suited. He's a position between actually worlds often, and you can hear it. You just have a about four minutes left. We have one more question in the chat that maybe you can start gesturing towards. Um, uh, it says, this is a question at something of an angle to re-socialization. Uh, you mentioned that the media disruption that Haydn experienced produced in him a level of stress. In literary history and art history, it's common to argue that the uncertainties of value and fragilities of labor in such periods of disruption might be reflected in the form and subject matter of the work. Mm -hmm. Can one read the form of Haydn's music as reflecting the changes that were causing him stress? Yeah, I argue that. <laughs> I mean, and I don't, I don't see it, see it as a, and of course, I'm sure the questioner isn't implying this either, you know, I don't see it as a reflection theory or, a, 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 you know, that it's not that one reads stress in it, it's that there are traces of these economic organisations, forms of, uh, you know, responses to the forms of economic organisation, because in part, because of course, one can find things in Haydn's music that go predate them massively, that are just exaggerated or reconfigured or used in different ways. And one example is just a kind of a cool example for you is something actually Emily, you've written a lot about this in another context too, is in the finale of his symphony numbers now number 98, it's big B flat symphony. Uh, which is a crazy finale. And it's, you know, I read this sort of, you know, in response to people like Nyai and, and people in lit literary studies. Uh, I read this as a kind of new zany aesthetic of work that sort of does respond to his new status as wage labourer and with an anonymous audience that have bought tickets where he's just kind of going through every single possible thing that you can do musically to entertain people such that it's completely crazy and fun, but also kind of a bit desperate. You know, it's got that desperate quality of the Dani, you know, and the Comedia dell'arte. And right towards the end, after he's been through all the, you know, Zalem and the violinist gets a solo and this, the music kind of breaks down and kind of gets exhausted and then sort of just has to wind up again and there are all these surprise key changes and suddenly it's all sort of noble with trumpets and drums right at the end he gives himself a piano solo and that's kind of funny because you know he's sitting in the middle jamming along as would have been customary on a sort of long and broad rip grand not you know, just putting the chords down, really keeping everyone together and just being a spectacle in the middle of the Haydn, the celebrity, 
And suddenly here he is playing arpeggios <laughs> and it's crap. It's a crap solo too. It's a sort of music box thing because you know, he wasn't a virtuoso. He just gets a bunch of arpeggios like, suddenly look at me, I'm working, here am I. And suddenly his labour is visible, you know, and he's suddenly at the, the forefront of this and it's this bizarre rupture and then it vanishes and the piece ends. And, um, you know, I read that one as a formal reflection of this desire to please, but also as a kind of a foregrounding of his own labouring self, his own sort of zanily labouring self in the piece. Um, and I think there are actually lots of examples that are comparable. And no one knew what to do with that, by the way, when it was published. And in fact, the earliest uh, publication in, in Chamber Reduction says underneath, if you've got the keys on your piano, this is what Dr. Haydn used to play. <laughs> so it's it sort of, even in the piece, it, it, the trace of his labouring person is, can't yet be eradicated. No, I was like Tom Tolley's argument. It's kind of a self caricature of him. Yeah. You know, he's paranoid about what the press might say. He's gotten ahead of them by doing by by doing that. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are now at four o'clock, so I guess this is the time where I thank you for your labor in producing this beautiful <laughs> book, uh, and to thank uh, the, the the folks for the questions. And yeah, thanks so much, Emily.